Hello there. Thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of Captains of Industry right here on CNBC Africa with me, Eugene Anangwe. Now, Rosette Chantal Rugamba is a household name in the region when it comes to strategizing for sustainable tourism and conservation. She is a veteran in the tourism sector, having served as Director General of Rwanda Tourism Board and also as Deputy CEO of Rwanda Development Board. Now, having left public service, she founded Songa Africa, a tourism and business conservation consultancy firm. Earlier on, I had a sit down with this captain of industry for a conversation on her trade. Right, Rosette, thank you so much for making time to speak to us. Yours is a story of inspiration. Some people see you where you sit today, uh, successful in your uh, private business, but uh, there are things probably they don't know, the journey of getting to where you are. And I want us to start this great conversation from there. What was it like uh, growing up? What was it like in terms of uh, preparing yourself to model this Rosette Rugamba that we see today? My journey is that my parents were refugees in, uh, in Uganda, uh, like many people here in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think my journey was a bit more privileged than other people who were in exile. Um, my dad was a brewer, he was a chief brewer, so he was working in our breweries in Ginger, and that gave us a bit of um, comfort. But I think what I really treasure about my young age and about where I was raised was that uh, my dad made sure that our home belonged to everybody. And uh, it was an open door. And everyone is who needed education or who was around the neighborhood knew that there was always a home in our place. So we grew up knowing that you don't sleep on the bed alone, that the bed must be shared the food must be shared. Uh, so that, I think, we forget that those are the ones that actually groom you into who you are today. Um, the other thing that I think was very, very important from my background was that every evening there was a celebration and there was a storytelling. Mm. And we should never, never underestimate the power of storytelling. There was a celebration in the evening uh, whereby we were being told uh, how wonderful our country was. That's when I learned about the land of a thousand hills. Uh, what I always reflect back and laugh when I came back here was the way they sang the song of the Nyabarongo River. It is, uh, it's a fantastic song that says the flowing river. Uh, little do you know that actually when you come here, it is brown and there's been soil erosion, but they sang about the river, not because of what I'm thinking now and looking at the soil erosion that is in the Nyabarongo, but it was what it meant. So, uh, so th and then we had to learn our language. We had to learn how to dance, although I'm not a very good uh, but I love the music. So that instilled the sense of actually saying that one day we will have to go back home. Uh, we were privileged to be hosted in a country where who we are, our education, we are grateful for the country that hosted us, but our parents always instilled that you belong somewhere. Do not forget right. that you are Rwandese and they told it in storytelling in the evenings. And I think um, if I fast track it, and when I came back to Rwanda, it was, it was about, uh, I was actually leaving what my parents were talking about. Uh, what I saw uh, was, um, despite the fact that I came back to Rwanda at the time uh, of, um, after genocide, uh, but I was seeing the Rwanda that my parents told me. So it was, as I was doing my tourism job, I was actually um, discovering my country. So I was a tourist in my country, right. but a tourist who had a great memory, not of what was happening at the time after post-genocide, but of what Rwanda was meant to be. And that's what the tourism industry, and that was what was my mandate. Right. And of course, 
you know, it's, it's really interesting when you say this, uh, I was a tourist in my own country, but of course, these days, when you look at um, you know domestic tourism, in many cases, in many instances, experts will tell you this is a sector that not so much effort, not so much focus is being put on. From where you said today, before we just even get into how you even started getting into the core of tourism, what is your main take as far as how we handle domestic tourism, the model of domestic tourism in terms of nurturing it, making it as vibrant as international tourism is concerned? Uh, for domestic tourism, um, we still have a long way, mm -hmm. but it is critical. But if we're talking in the context of Rwanda, I think it was very important to understand what is tourism. Um, you had to redefine, because you, before you redefine something, you don't tell people who are already living in their own country to start discovering it. I actually said I was a tourist in my own country because I, was, I never lived here. So uh, you always have to put things in the right context. So um, in terms of uh, Rwanda, the most important thing, if I can take you back, it is tourism's mandate and the mandate that His Excellency the President gave me at the time when I was Head of Tourism and National Parks was that Tourism 1 was a poverty reduction strategy. Number 2, it was going to be a tool for our image building, uh, which, but also the third one was how can the rewards of tourism be distributed in the whole country? So. At that time, you cannot start with domestic tourism. Right. There are many other things that you needed to, but what you needed is to make sure that people value what it is and ensure that when you get the international visitors, then they will be ready for them. For domestic tourism to thrive is we, want, we must start with our children. Uh, I think what helped myself and other people is like the schools we went to um, in Uganda, you had a session where you had to go to visit museums. Mm -hmm. You went to visit forests. It was part of the geography lesson. Mm -hmm. and, and that is how you start instilling the values that will eventually turn into people becoming domestic uh, tourists. Mm -hmm. So we must start from the grassroots. Let's start from the schools, where schools and education system allows children to go and understand the importance of visiting. Because one thing we must remember, uh, the essence and the rewards of tourism are not just about revenue. It's about preservation. Sure. It's about sustainability that yeah. we're going to talk about. Yeah. But how do you talk about sustainability if somebody's not already valuing what it is? So uh, in terms of children visiting national parks, visiting museums and learning about our history and our culture, and our role back, the things that I was listening from my parents as storytelling is what instilled what I was able to do as an adult. Uh, so that's the one part of the domestic tourism. Now for the older ones, for the people who actually uh, have uh, the money and can move from A to B, it is, it is a sense of relaxation. I think we are in a world now where people are working so hard. It is no longer a luxury. It is a necessity. And they need to rewind themselves. You need to cool off. And what we need to do in the private sector is provide opportunities for different pockets. Mm -hmm. That if somebody has got this pocket, they can actually afford to sleep in a hotel of $20, $30, $40, $100, according to different pockets. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are there right now. So it, you don't have to be. Which, because if you actually look at it, people are spending that money within their towns. Mm. But because you have grown up not knowing the reasons of relaxing, the reasons of family going together and spending quality time. So I think the way it needs to be embraced, it must be embraced the same way we've done in Uganda. Mm. The same way we've done the don't litter. Uh, now it is in our DNA, you don't litter because the government made it a strategy to say it's wrong to litter. Today, when you sit on the private sector side, what are those things that you seem to be discovering that, oh, when I was in government, I was thinking differently of this, and now that I'm in private, 
I think things are different from the perspective that I had before. What are those things that could be there today that you can share? I think before I answer that, let me celebrate the opportunity that I was given yeah. by this government to to be able to uh, to be part of this government, uh, to have played a role in both tourism and conservation, and we are very aware that uh, tourism is the number one foreign exchange earner. Uh, so that really uh, set the scene uh, for, for, for the policies that were put in place at the time and are still being put in place. Um, I am one of those people who can actually stand firm and say I celebrate what government does and this is one of the countries in the world to testify and I go testifying all over the world mm -hmm. that you, private and public sector are working very well together. Mm -hmm. um, I would never have gone into private sector had government not done what it did. Uh, for tourism to flourish, for any private sector to flourish, one, first and foremost, it is peace and stability. Without peace and stability, private sector doesn't create peace and stability. It is government. So we had a leadership, a government that was and still is committed to make sure that the country is safe. Um, now, beyond, beyond that, when the uh, policies are put in place, there was a clarity of actually saying tourism is private sector led. And at the same time, private sector were being facilitated. I think if we roll back, we know very well that government was the first to actually uh, encourage the first five star hotel at a time when nobody believed and even agreed that Rwanda needed a five star hotel. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so, th so those are key things that I can say I celebrate. And those are the things that actually uh, made me see that government has done what it needs to do. It has put the infrastructure in place, um, the, 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 poli the, the other policies, uh, the airlines that are supposed to fly people in, that was done. There are many things that the government put in place to ensure that now uh, this, this, the scene is set for private sector to get involved and that's when I thought it is my turn now to come in and actually uh, take advantage and embrace the conducive environment and that governments that were put in place. Were put in place. Right, yeah. of course. We want to take a very short break and then when we come back we'll definitely be looking at the issue of sustainability. How do we sustain this growth trajectory that we have seen here in Rwanda as far as the tourism industry is concerned? Of course, stay with us. Uh, this is a special edition and of course it is Captains of Industries and when we come back we have that and much more. Keep talking to us at CNBC Africa. You can tweet me directly at I'm Eugene Anangwe. See you on the other side of the break. And welcome back. Thank you so much for watching CNBC Africa. This is Captains of Industry and our guest today is Rosette Chantal Rugamba. Let's carry on with that conversation. Let's now take this conversation forward. Of course, uh, look at the sustainability. In the first break of the show, we did talk about the journey that has, has been made both in government and for private players in uh, the tourism industry. But talk to me about uh, your perspective of making tourism sustainable. Uh, the world and everybody is beginning to notice the importance of tourism. Mm -hmm. Tourism is one of uh, worldwide. Uh, I think if my figures are right, uh, worldwide it was over 1,533,000,000 people that mm -hmm. traveled the world. Mm -hmm. But if we go back to our exact continent, uh, we received uh, in Africa 63 million uh, people in tourism and uh, if you look globally uh, Africa only received 5% of the world tourism arrivals 
uh, and, but was still only 3% of the revenue. Tourism again uh, creates employment. One in 10 jobs in the world are by tourists. So one of the questions we've always said in the tourism industry, I think we're not talking enough or the right communication. And one of the things that I advocate for, I always say, we need to take tourism out of the leisure pages and put it into the business pages, which will help translate into the sustainability that you're talking about. Um, so having said that, uh, it is very critical now that even from policy uh, statements, from policy documents, that governments no longer just write that this is our tourism strategy. Mm -hmm. It should actually be called sustainable tourism strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, that because when you talk about tourism, you're talking about, especially on our continent, it is national parks that are visited. If these wildlife are not protected, then we cannot ensure the sustainability that we're talking about. Another key pillar is the local community. Um, I have lived it. I experienced it um, when uh, long way back, uh, communities were not assigned a portion, especially communities that live around the protected areas. And that's why poaching was taking place, because they didn't see the value of protecting this wildlife. Uh, but you know very well that our government, in fact, um, it used to be 10%, it's now gone up to 15%. But even beyond that, everything that they are doing is geared towards the local community really having a direct benefit uh, from, uh, from, from, from tourism. Uh, but also the other thing of sustainability, it is uh, preserving our history and culture. Remember that when uh, tourists visit a destination, uh, they really want to know about the history and culture. That's why they've come. Uh, but if we don't preserve our history and culture, one, tourists are not going to come uh, because they will come and find a different culture. Uh, so tourism is now becoming a tool not only of sustainability of uh, wildlife in terms of environment, but also of preserving our history and culture. Uh, which brings the authenticity of what a destination can actually provide. Right. But of course, you mentioned the issue of revenue shares and um, some communities, uh, I mean, let's now broaden this conversation and not just look at Rwanda specific. I mean, some communities have always uh, probably complained uh, that when I was poaching, for instance, I would actually get some money uh, by selling these animal fats but today the government promises that we will do a revenue share and it doesn't come. And so let's talk about the role of governments in actually keeping that promise and making uh, you know, these efforts uh, bear fruits, the fruits that are desired of it. What, what needs to be done then? Uh, as I said previously, it is really, it starts with um, the policy side. Because if everything is not documented and it is in the policy document of every uh, government, then it will be difficult to actually implement. Mm -hmm. And once you finish what we call the policy document, which is the wildlife policies and the tourism policies, then you have to go to the what we call the Tourism Act and the Wildlife Act, because those become legal instruments. And these are things that people are really watching and making sure that, uh, are we really paying attention to what is actually involved in that? And to actually get it right, it's a lot of people need to get involved. There's one, the clarity of tourism, of the country, the government positioning tourism and uh, conservation as a priority sector. Then we've got um, the parliament that actually enacts the laws, uh, that they must have a stake in it. Mm -hmm. And then we now have the tourism bodies and everybody else who is, who is uh, concerned to make sure that that is done. But beyond that, uh, I'm privileged enough to be part of other global bodies, which um, uh, I'll talk about UNWTO, which is the United Nations World Tourism Organization. I sit on the Global Ethics Committee, and the Global Ethics Committee, one of our roles is to really sit and make sure that certain things that are not allowing for sustainability, are, things are put in place. We are now working on uh, over-tourism, over tourism is another key thing beyond sustainability. Uh, we started with things which are responsible tourism, there's, there's sustainable tourism, and then there's also now 
uh, the threats, the tourism, while it's very good, it can actually have huge negative impacts. Let's talk about that. We have to face that fact mm -hmm. that uh, it is a reality yes. and we should not wait. And that's when sustainability comes in to avoid because once it becomes, it's declared over tourism, then it's already a problem. Mm -hmm. What sustainability comes in is avoid it becoming, and what is over tourism and what is uh, the, the negative impact? It is when, uh, for instance, you will go to one of the national parks for one lion, 20 cars. Mm -hmm. That's already over tourism, it's not right. Mm -hmm. Uh, where you go to a city, I'll give an example for instance now, you're in Barcelona, you're in all these beautiful places of one of the beaches. Let's say, I don't know what's happening in Mombasa, but you find a, a crowded beach. But our government's it's ready to say, no, we are fully booked and, and turn down those dollars, I that, think those extra dollars. This is really what we're advocating for. Um, uh, and it starts by actually, uh, and this is why I want to address individuals, mm. yourself, myself, tourism is everybody's business. It's not just about government. Once the local community starts saying we are too crowded, we are being pushed out of our community, then people start listening. You have a voice. Mm -hmm. People have voices. And we've seen placards of where people say, you know, we no longer want more tourists. Because what are the negative impacts? People have crowded a place. I'll give you an example. Uh, there are ships that dock in certain places. They will come, thousands of people off the ship. They will come, look at an activity, not even leave a penny. What can governments do? First of all, charge for that docking. Mm -hmm. And then charge for actually visiting that. And then maybe even go to the stage of limiting the numbers of people that can actually dock in such a place. Mm -hmm. When you go to national parks, the best example is uh, Volcanoes National Park. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we, ha we are succeeding now? Uh, and I must commend RDB and the government of Rwanda and actually the other people within who are involved in the gorilla conservation. Because by limiting the numbers and saying only eight people per family are going to be visited once a day, that has actually resulted into the successful results that we are seeing now of this last census showing that it's 1,004 and now the last IUCN report that actually says that gorillas are no longer critically endangered, they are actually just endangered. Recently there was a forum here, the first of its kind, uh, and, 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 and it was the business of conservation, where speakers were making their case that conservation should now not just be looked at as a humanity issue, that if we don't conserve the environment and our natural resources, then we risk you know, uh, humanity being wiped out. So we should stop thinking of it from that perspective and now look at it as a business opportunity so that people invest in it knowing that there will be returns from the investment. Is this something that you think is viable? Do you think this is the way we should be looking at conservation from a business perspective? Absolutely. Um, I really agree with that aspect. But not, it's not going to be a standalone. Mm -hmm. I think that conference was to bring in a certain aspect that is missing. Because a lot of the conservationists, in my point of view, uh, were really looking at more on uh, the research elements, ensuring that um, the wildlife is protected. Uh, all those are aspects of uh, conservation. But, I, but I, we think that what was really missing, and which I was privileged enough to see the benefits, is two elements. Community as a key part of the conservation success. Mm -hmm. They must not be a by the way, they must be an integral part of every policy that we do. If they're not involved, we will not be celebrating success. Mm -hmm. uh, but secondly, it is that element of business. Business because how else are you going to conduct research for the sustainability of what we are doing. How else are you going to give the 10% or the 15% back to the community if you're not raising the funds? Mm -hmm. Everything needs funds to be raised. But I think beyond um, the business part, uh, although I didn't attend that meeting, but uh, uh, it was also educating future conservationists, uh, especially on our continent here. 
uh, we, we tend to find that uh, this sector was not given the credit or the focus that it should. So for us to talk about sustainability in our conservation, we must have the future generation that will actually take up management of national parks. So I'm glad those conversations are taking place. I want to wish you all the best. Of course, Rosette, thank you for making time. And may all these dreams and aspirations flourish just like those gardens that you have back at home. Thank you. That's an sign of your time. And that's it for this edition of Captains of Industries. Keep it CNBC Africa for more conversations like this and much more. As always, I'm Eugene Anangwe. Goodbye for now.